Amen? First scripture, Matthew 28, verse 16 and 17, just to set a little precedent here. This is after the resurrection. In fact, this is like the last line of the Gospel of uh, Matthew, the last couple lines. It says, the 11 disciples went away into Galilee. 11, remember there's not 12 anymore. We're at the end of the story. One is missing or one is gone. One has taken himself out. Who's that? Judas, right? So now there's 11. They went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. Next verse. And when they, remember, these are disciples, believers, his team. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. Recently on Wednesday nights, I've been doing a little mini-series on the disciples. And I'm a little fascinated with them because I gotta be honest with you, I think they're very undervalued. And what do I mean by that? My first time I ever went to Greece, and again, we'll be going to Greece next year, you see a lot of emblems of early Christianity. Some have been lost, some still remain. I talked about the pitchfork towards heaven. And there's others. But the one that has remained through it all, long before the cross was used as an emblem of Christianity, was the fish. You see it in first century buildings, on first century walls, in first century mosaics, which are little tiles to make a picture. And I remember one of my team asking our guide, uh, what's with the fish? Why is the fish such a powerful emblem for Christianity? Is it because of the parable of the loaves and the fishes? And our guide, remember these are not believers, these are historians. Let me stay up here, I pulled my calf, if that's all right, I'm gonna stay up here, all right? If not, I don't want you to see me all hobbling back up here. And the, these are guides, these are secular people, probably raised Greek Orthodox, got degrees in colleges, and now they're working as guides. And I'll never forget what our guide said. She, she goes, I gotta be honest with you, nobody really knows where it originated, but I have a feeling it originated with the people and not with the leadership. And that the people, because it was such an easy emblem to draw on a wall, a top of an ark, and then a bottom, you have your fish. In many areas within the Roman Empire, it was illegal to be a Christian. You could be put to death. So how did they communicate with each other? Through emblems. And many people would put an ark in the dirt and leave it. And if somebody came by and put the bottom half of the fish, it was a little wink, wink. I'm with you, brother. I'm with you, sister. So she went on to say, I really believe it was people associating themselves with not as Christi Christians or Christianity, but with I am of the way of the fishermen. Yeah. Remember, Jesus left us no books. Nothing written outside in the mud when the woman was caught in adultery. Jesus wrote nothing. He did not leave us with a manu manuscript. He did not leave us with a gospel. It would be the fishermen who would have to tell his story. And it would be the fishermen that had to keep it alive. And it would be the fishermen who would be martyred and made examples of. But yet, my friends, I think it could be argued we are today still of the way of the fishermen. Amen? We spend more time talking about Old Testament prophets than we do about the fishermen. But yet, Jesus says, even the least in the kingdom now is greater than any from the Old Testament. I think we undervalue them. We love to poke fun at them. Now, let's be fair, some of them you cannot preach upon because they're only listed in a list. Right, I can't go up here and go, this is part three of my series on Thaddeus. Because Thaddeus says nothing in the Bible, right? But there are some you can certainly highlight. And the one I wanna talk about today is one that has always been associated with doubt. Anybody wanna take a gander on who that is? Thomas. Thomas. In fact, I have a picture. This is the famous Caravaggio painting called The Incredulity of St. Thomas, one of the most expensive paintings in the world, right? And it shows Thomas, the final scene of Thomas with Jesus after the resurrection. Remember Thomas, we're gonna look at it in a little bit, says, unless I can touch the wounds, I shall not believe, and you can see. Now this mask, this is an Italian painter, Caravaggio, who was a piece of work, nobody really knows much about him. Died young in his early 30s, but he
but he created a style where his lighting and his moods would set the tone of the painting. Today we call that the Baroque style. See, I'm trying to learn a little art history. That's all I know right now. All right, let's move on. <laughs> Next picture. Ah, this sits in front of the Vatican. This is Bernini's sculpture of the apostle. Again, look at his hand. In all Renaissance art of Thomas, he is always portrayed with the finger. I always thought he'd be a great 49er fan. <laughs> now, I know some Raider fan is sitting out there going, yeah, that's how many games they're gonna win, Pastor Adam. <laughs> and you know what? That's not right. It's not right for you to think that. He's always pointed with his finger. Why? Because Jesus says, come and touch, all right? So this is how he's always portrayed in art. Thomas is mentioned in all four Gospels with the name Thomas. Thomas, we know, traveled as furth furthest east than any other disciple. In fact, Thomas went all the way. He's the only disciple to set foot on today, what we call, well, it was called that in his day too, India. In fact, I have a picture. That, my friends, that big mountain right there is in the heart of a city called Chennai, or it used to be called Madras. And that is St. Thomas's Mount. This is where the prophet would be uh, killed. And on top of that mountain is where Thomas was martyred, and that is the monument that is up there. Interesting, did Thomas make a difference in India? Yep. Today, India has 10% Christianity. Amen. And remember, India was cut off from the Western world. Well, hold on. Was cut off from the Western world for over 1,000, 1,500 years. It would be the Portuguese and the English who would be the first Europeans to go back into India, and this would be in the 1490s. This is when Columbus would sail, the time period, 500 years ago, following me? And when they land in India, they thought they'd be nothing but pagans, but yet they find big communities of believers blew their minds. The, and when they were asked, how do you believe, of what faith are you? Their answer was, we are St. Thomas Christians. Today, India has a 10% Christian population, which you might think, oh, well, it's only 10%, but India is so big, that 10% makes it the fifth largest Christian nation on earth. How about that? So Thomas made a difference. But I wanna talk about Thomas. I find him fascinating. Number one, he is only mentioned in the list of the 12 in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's it. He says nothing, he's only listed. Aha, but then we get to the Gospel of John, and we see, and we start seeing clues about him. For example, every time Thomas is introduced, you see something like this, John 21, verse one and two. It says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias, same, same body of water, and in this way he showed himself, next verse, Simon Peter and Thomas called the twin. Every time you see Thomas, you see the word Didymus or the twin attached to him. Now this is interesting. And for a number of years, a lot of people said he was a twin. But there's a problem with this thought. Number one, if he's a twin, who's he a twin with? Who's his twin brother? Were they fraternal? Were they identical? Bible's totally silent. And it never says he was a twin. It always says he was called a twin. In fact, do you realize that the name Thomas is not really a name? It's Aramaic, which is kind of a slang for Hebrew. This is what Jesus spoke in his day. And if you look up the word Thomas in Aramaic, this is the word you get, my first screen. In Aramaic, it's the word te oma. Te means two, number two. Oma means like a double. A double. So a te oma literally would be, you're my double. You're my mini me. You are my identical twin. You following me here? So in Aramaic, they called him a lookalike. And if you called him in Greek, you called him Didymus, a twin. How many of you are familiar that Jesus liked to change names? Not himself, 
but with his team. Did he ever change any of their names? Did he ever give out a nickname? You're looking at me, I don't know. How many know Peter is not a name? Oh no, I went to school with a Peter. No, I'm talking about the first time it was ever used. It means rock, right? Jesus changes his name from Simon to rock, right? Jesus gave that name. Jesus has two uh, brothers, James and John. How many know he changed their names too? He started calling them the sons of Zebedee or the sons of thunder. Changed their names. A few weeks ago, I preached on Andrew. Andrew's Greek. He was a Jew. He probably did not have a Greek name. In fact, Andrew was never used as a name prior to the New Testament. You can't look up any old article of any type of literature and find Andrew because it's not a name. It's Greek for manly, macho, tough guy. That's what it means. And I showed on that Wednesday night that every time somebody wanted to go to Jesus, they went to Andrew alone, and Andrew would bring them to Jesus. I have a feeling Jesus changed his name because he sounds like he was a little bit of the muscle of the 12. Yo, Andrew, we want to see Jesus. Oh, yeah, I'll get back. He talks like Stallone. Yo, yo, I'll get back to you. <laughs> Wait right here. Stay behind the red velvet rope. So we see name changing a lot. Even Apostle Paul, which, uh, Saul of Tarsus would take a new name. You see a lot of name changes. I don't believe Thomas's name was Thomas. I believe it was a nickname. It kind of makes me a little nervous because if Jesus likes to give out nicknames, I don't know about you, maybe it hasn't stopped. Imagine getting to heaven and you got a nickname you don't even know about. Anybody in here have a nickname? I always wanted to have a cool nickname. After watching that baptism video with that white gown on me, I look like the Pillsbury Doughboy, though. So I don't, <laughs> I don't wanna, I'm not soliciting that as my new nickname, okay? You know? <laughs> my grandfather, since birth, still alive, 92, lives in Hollister, calls me Red. I don't think I really need to explain that one to you. <laughs> All right, so that's one nickname that I have. And uh, I have a couple others, but they will rename, uh, remain anonymous right now, and I don't want to talk about it, but uh, Thomas, the double, the mini-me, the doubting double. How many know his story reaches into our very lexicon of our languages? For example, the word doubt and twin have become almost synonymous throughout many languages. Let me show you two ancient languages, Greek, the word on the left is doubt. The word on the right is for double or two. How about the next uh, language, Latin, another ancient language. The word on the left means doubt. The word on the right means two or double. How about modern languages? Here is German, the word on the left is doubt. The word on the right is for double. See a similarity? How about our own language? English, I don't need to explain that one, I hope. You can, uh, <laughs> you can read that one. His story has crept into our very language. What is he? He's the doubting twin. He's the doubting look-alike. He's the doubting mini-me. He's the doubting double. Interesting, Jews were not allowed to make graven images. So if John really wants to let you know what Thomas looked like, he cannot draw you a picture. It violates the Ten Commandments. So in literature, if he wanted you to know what he looked like, what would he call him? The lookalike. And he never gives an explanation of who the lookalike is. If you're reading a gospel, who is the one person that needs no introduction? Jesus of Nazareth. Could it be John is telling you as you read his book, Thomas looked exactly like Jesus? You look like anybody? Anybody in here look like anybody? I get Brad Pitt a lot, but I, I, don't, I don't, I really don't see it. <laughs> so, 
Thomas looks like somebody. Could it be Jesus? Could it be one of the other 12? Who knows? But he looks like somebody, and our author's given us no explanation on who he is the lookalike of. So we, we learn that about him. Also in the Gospel of John, we see three scenes of Thomas, and here's where we're getting to. I wanna show you all three of the scenes that Thomas interacts. The first one is John 11, verse seven. He has just learned that Lazarus, his friend, is, has died. So Jesus, after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. But the disciples said, uh, teacher, uh, <laughs> in case you forgot, uh, the Jews sought to kill you there or stone you, and you wanna go back there again? Right? It didn't end well the last time we were there. They almost killed you, and you were ready to go back. So look what Jesus says. Jesus answered them and says, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anybody walks in the day, he does not stumble because he can see the light of the world. How many know Jesus is answering figuratively? Right? But if one walks in the darkness or the night, he can stumble because the light is not with him. In other words, why are you fretting the light bulb is walking with you, 12. Don't worry about it. Did you catch that little message? He's, that's what he's telling them. Yeah. Let's see how they respond. These things he said after that, he said to them, by the way, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go so I can wake him up. Okay, let's see how this goes over. And his disciples said, well, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Let him sleep. You ever read the Gospels and you think there's times where Jesus just had to look at him, at his team and go, really? <laughs> Dude. Because watch what Jesus says. However, Jesus spoke about his Lazarus' death. But they thought he was speaking about taking a nap. You ever talk to somebody you know there's no connection? Winston Churchill always said something fascinating to me. He goes, never leave a meeting of four or more people thinking everybody heard the same thing. That's total wisdom right there. That's true. Because how many times have you said something, you made it clear as day, or you thought? Hmm? Here. Next verse. So Jesus said to them plainly, plainly, Lazarus is dead. How many know that's pretty plain? And look at this, here comes a rebuke. And I'm glad for your sakes, 12, I wasn't there. Because now you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. And Thomas, who was called the twin, the lookalike, said to his other disciples, here we go, let us go too so we can die with him. Boy, what a pick-me-up Thomas is, huh? <laughs> anybody have anybody like that in their life? It'll never work. No. If the ship's going down, I'll go down with the ship. Who are you talking about, Thomas? Maybe we go die with him. Die with Lazarus or die with Jesus? Take your pick. All right, so Jesus tried to speak figuratively and beautifully and poetically, and Thomas did not understand, right? Let's look at number two, John 14, verse one. Jesus is saying to the 12, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you 12 but I go to prepare a place for you, 12. And if I go and prepare a place for you, 12, I will come again, and I will receive you, 12, to myself. Remember, this is who he's talking to. That where I am, there you can be with me. There you may be also. All right, let's see how this goes over. And where I go, 12, you know. But Thomas said to him, uh, Lord, yeah, uh, yeah, whatever. We don't know where you're going. And how can we know the way? 
Here comes Jesus. Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, verse seven. And if you had known me, Thomas, you would have known my Father as well. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Why? Because you have seen me. Two examples, I mean, no, two times, the twin, the lookalike, the mini-me, is not understanding. And both have to do with resurrection. I'm gonna raise Lazarus, I go to wake him up. Huh? If he's sleeping, let him sleep. He looked tired last time we saw him. No, he's dead. Oh, but if we go, they're gonna kill you, because last time we were there, they wanted to kill you. I'm nevertheless, we're gonna go. All right, I guess I'll die with you. I am the way. Where I go, you cannot go, but you know the way. Uh, Lord, I don't know what you're talking about. How can we know the way? Do you leave us a map? Again, resurrection. Let's look at the third one, the last one. John 20, 24. Now Thomas called the twin, the lookalike. One of the 12 was not with them when Jesus resurrected. Okay, this is after Easter. Next verse. The other disciples therefore said to Thomas, we have seen the Lord, Tom. So Thomas said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and I put my finger into those print of the nails and if, unless I put my hand into his side, I'm not gonna believe now, this is a fascinating scripture, and I think it gives us a lot of clues. Number one, how many know the Romans crucified thousands of people? Thousands, according to Josephus, the same year as Jesus. Thousands. Now, how many know every one of them shared the same wounds? Feet, hands, right? But how many of you know Jesus had wounds that were unique only to Jesus? Not other crucifixion victims. A crown of thorns, right? But there would be another wound that was unique to Jesus as well. And that would be what? When it got dark and the earth was shaken and everything was getting spooky, they had to speed up the death. And they didn't know if Jesus was alive or dead. You remember the story? So one of the Romans told the soldiers to what? Take the spear? and stab him, because even if he's unconscious, you're gonna get a reaction if there's life. But instead, there was zero reaction and water and blood poured out. Remember the story? How does Thomas know that? How does Thomas, how can Thomas say, unless I touch the wound in his side? He was watching, exactly. But the Bible says that they all ran, and I believe it. But I believe Thomas ran to a point that he could watch from a distance. Why? I have seen this guy calm the seas. This ain't over, trust me. I have seen this guy rebuke the wind. This is not over. Something, angels, something's gonna happen. Trust me on this. I have seen demons flee. I have seen lame walk. I have seen mute speak. I have seen the blind see. I, I can go on and on and on and on and on, the things I've seen. This is not over. And when he saw that Roman stab him in the side and nothing happened, he knew Jesus was dead, and I believe all little hope that he had died, on that, died that day as well. So now the others are coming in going, hey, where have you been? He was here. The women saw him, we ran to the tomb, we came back here, he showed up, he spoke to us, so, no, no, unless, unless I can take my hand and touch the print of his nails, unless I can take my hand and stick it into his side. Interesting, a few verses earlier, Mary Magdalene tries to cling to him, and Jesus says, don't touch me, don't touch me, for I have not ascended into heaven. Thomas is asking for something that Jesus has already declined somebody with. My friends, be careful when you challenge God. 
Because I'm here to tell you something. God is up to the challenge, amen? And you can challenge God. I wanna to touch you in a way that nobody else has touched you. Be ready. Because the Lord's ready to meet you. Unless I touch him, I'm not gonna believe. All right, next verse. Let's see what happens. After eight days, the disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them this time. And Jesus came, the doors being shut. Jesus stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. Now how many know Jesus, would, if Jesus appears to me in a room and didn't open a door, the first words better be peace to me, you know. Because <laughs> after that it'll be, Adam, get back in here. But then he says to Thomas, let me know Jesus hears your words. Be careful with your idle talk. Thomas, come here. Reach your finger here. Look at my hands. And reach your hand here, Thomas, and put it into my side. Thomas, do not be unbelieving, but be believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, this is the last thing we see Thomas say in the Gospels. Thomas says, oh my Lord, and my God. Three times. Thomas has a problem with resurrection. Remember our first scripture? Many come to worship Jesus, but many doubted. Why am I speaking on the doubting double? Because my friends, I believe we're all Thomases. I believe Jesus knew this, and this is why Jesus says you must be born again. Because my friends, we are all twins. You were born with water breaking first. Jesus says one born of water and one born of spirit. When your mama's water bag broke, that was the sign to her and to the rest of the world you were coming. And how many know that first breath you took was a scream and if it wasn't, the doctor smacked you on the hind end. How many know that's a welcome to this world moment right there, that the world's a little tough. And that first one, the Bible says, is doomed to fail. But my Bible shows me it's the second one who's always blessed. How many know what I'm talking about? Book of Genesis. You were just gonna do a synopsis of the book of Genesis. How many know it's a story of brothers? You have Cain, you have Abel. Who's born first? Cain. But who had the blessing? The second. You have Ishmael, you have Isaac, who was born first, but who had the blessing? Isaac. Isaac. You had Esau, you had Jacob, who was born first, but who had the blessing? Even though he had to finagle it with his mother, he got the blessing. You have the first king of Israel, Saul. You have the second king of Israel, David. Who has the blessing? The second. My friends, we are all the twin. We are all physical beings, and we are all a twin nature, spiritual being as well. Many come to worship Jesus, but many doubt. I believe I've seen too much of Thomas in the church lately. I've seen people wanting to come to worship, but filled with doubt, filled with skepticism, and filled with fear. Filled with thoughts of death, Thomas was. And what do I mean by that, Pastor Adam? How many know it's an election year? I find this election, and I've been, I've been through a few in my lifetime, I'm 52. I find this one unique as any. I see all y'all perking up, oh, here we go. Here we go. Talk about that crazy guy with the hair. Talk about crooked Hillary. Talk about, huh. I've never seen an election so divisive. We were recently in Israel, and every time we got in a cab, much to my wife's chagrin, I would ask the cab driver, hey, what do you think of America's election coming up? Oh, crazy man, Donald Trump, crazy man. That's my Ju Jerusalem taxi driver impersonation. Crazy, crazy, oh my God, crazy, crazy. Then we get to Italy. I asked the taxi drivers there, hey, America's got an election coming up, what do you think? Oh, Aren't you tired? This is my Italian taxi driver. Aren't you tired of the Clinton lies? 
They've been lying to you for 30, 30 years, 25 years. Aren't you tired, America, tired of the, of the lies? Lie, 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 lie. <laughs> and I thought, wow. And then I come home, and I look at all your Facebook posts. <laughs> Why am I talking about this? Because, my friends, I'm here to tell you something today. Don't live life as a Thomas. Let me ask you something. What if Jesus came down or an angel and said, I'm willing to bless you crazy for the next four years, but the person you do not want in that office will be there? I don't know about you, but I take it in a heartbeat. Wouldn't even think twice. Why? Because my trust is not in any man's system. My trust, <laughs> and I'm as patriotic as they come. And I will vote, and I'll vote my conscience. But I'm, this pulpit's not here to tell you what candidate to vote for. This pulpit is to tell you there is one in heaven who needs no election, who needs no endorsement, who needs not to campaign, who needs not a primary. And too many of us are wrapped up like Thomas, like, oh my God, all hell's gonna break loose. Let me tell you something. November 5th, you're gonna see a smile on this face regardless. I've lived, I've lived under Democrats, I've lived under Republicans. You know what, as long as I keep my trust in God, I, God will keep me all right. And here's another thing. I know I'll get an email or two about this, but I am convinced old glory does not fly in heaven. Because it's a man system, and man systems will rise up, and man systems are doomed to fail as well. But there is one enduring power, and that is Jesus Christ. But too many of us are worshiping, and we're, oh my God, this thing's got a stress, I'm not, I'm, I can't sleep. And I, oh, I tried to watch the convention, Pastor. I'm gonna, I wanted to puke after five seconds. And uh, oh, 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 oh. Here's my scripture for this year. Psalms 37, Psalms 37, four and five. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself, be happy. Well, only if so and so, no, be happy. Delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Verse five, next verse. And commit, again, this is, this is up to us, not God. We must do the delight and we must do the committing. Commit your way to the Lord and also trust in him and he, the Lord, shall bring it to pass. All right? Delight, commit, and trust. Oh, very simple. And what do you get? You get your past led and you get the desires of your heart. I don't know about you, but that's easier than a cake recipe. I can do those three things right there. I can be happy even when I have nothing to be happy about. Why? I have that power. I have that control. I can commit. I can say if I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it. I can do, that's my power. And I can trust. How many of you know trust and faith are similar? They're twins. But there's a big difference. I believe faith comes from heaven. And we have, Jesus keeps saying have the faith of God. But trust begins with us. So my friends, we learned, we have to learn during all of, and how many you know in three years we're gonna start all this crazy election stuff? Any, it's never ending. You need to put your trust on a leash. Everybody familiar with a leash? Anybody walk their dog? How many know you can do more than walk your dog with a leash now? Look at this picture. You have my picture up there, guys? When they start doing that? <laughs> Hopefully you don't have to carry a baggie and pick up after those as well, but. Uh, <laughs> first time I saw that, I thought, oh my Lord, is this what we're coming to? But I once lost my daughter at um, Six Flags. Anybody ever lose a, your kid at a mall or amusement park or the beach or the? It was all no. All right, just me. All right, fine. I lost my kid. I'm not proud of it. <laughs> and when I saw that, I'm thinking, oh, that's what I need right there. 
I need one of these leashes. So my daughter's now 16. I told her when she's 18, I'll loosen it a little bit. And, uh... <laughs> a child's not getting away from the parent. A dog's not getting away with that leash. A dog's gonna go where you want to go, eventually. My friends, your faith must leash trust. Because faith in God will not waver. The devil knows he can't get me out of church. The devil knows he can't take my knowing I'm saved away. He knows that. If I get a bad report from the doctor, the devil knows I'm going to believe for a healing even to my last breath. He can't take that away. But he can erode at my trust. He can erode that this world's crazy system is going to hell in a handbasket. He can erode my trust that race relations in this nation have never been as bad since the Civil War. He could erode my trust in, in, in my state and the taxes. He could erode my trust in all the, but you know what, my faith now says, no, 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 bring it back over here. Because I don't care what they do. I don't care what Washington DC does. I don't care what Sacramento does and I don't care what City Hall here in San Jose does. Right, I can vote and I can believe this or that, but my blessing is tied up with God and not any man, not any administration, not any party. And every time my trust starts to waver, I bring it back in. I bring it back in, because I have the faith of God. I have the faith of God that whatever, November 5th, the next four years, whoever wins, I'm gonna have an open mind. Hope they do good. If they don't, I won't be shocked. If they do, I might be a little shocked, but whatever. <laughs> but that's not my trust. My trust is that my life is in the hands of God that my blessing isn't because he or she is in that office. My blessing is because God has my life. So, I'm gonna take a little faith walk. And every time I watch the news, I gotta tell my trust, no, 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 get back over here. Get back, heal, heal. That's not what you tell your kid on the leash, that's what you tell the dog on the leash. Heal, stick it in close. Stay close to me, trust. Stay close to the faith of God. And no matter what, I'll be all right. Stand to your feet, everybody. With that being said, I must be obedient to our pastor. So today's altar call is not for somebody just off the street. If, if, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. It's to my brothers and my sisters in Christ. Because it says many come to worship Jesus, but many doubt. Thomas had a real hard problem with believing there's life after death. He didn't believe it for Lazarus. He didn't believe it when Jesus was talking. And even when it happened, he still didn't believe it. Did you catch that? Miracles, healings, preaching, Thomas was okay with. He saw it. He saw it. But believing in life after death, he had a big time problem with it. But I love the last thing he says. We see three times he says the wrong things, but the last thing he says, the doubter, the doubting look-alike, what does he say? My Lord and my God. That's even more powerful than what Peter said, thou art the Christ. Thomas called him God, and Jesus never rebuked him. Jesus just says, you say that because you believe. Blessed are those who don't see and believe. My friends, I don't need to see the person I vote for in office to believe there's blessing. I don't need to look at my bank account right now and believe that I'm blessed. I know it's coming. I don't need to see my medical chart and read everything on it to not know I'm gonna be well. I don't need to see a pink slip to trust God ended that job because he's got something better for me on the other side. I guess what I'm saying is no matter what life throws at you, and let's be honest, how much control over these things do we really have? Every vote counts? Yeah, but we're California. How many know huh, in the primaries, it's already settled by the time it comes here? Have you noticed that we're last? Is it because we're the furthest west? I don't know what this is, but I remember I'd get all excited last time. Mm, let's check out these debates on both sides. Mm. 
Yeah, but by the time it comes here, it's already been, it's already been said. There's been a number of years I went to go vote in the afternoon and the whole thing's over. There's somebody conceding. Oh, I gave it my best. What's my point? It's going to be settled by the rest of this country and really not with us. And I know some of you are like, oh, great. Now I feel even worse. <laughs> my point is it's out of our hands. And what's going to happen is going to happen. But I can pray to my God every night. I can worship him every day. I could be a tool in his tool belt every time he needs me. I can speak good over a bad situation. I can bring hope when there's no hope in a person's life. I can speak life when all they think about is death. I can speak health when all they think about is sickness. I have the control over these things. And I can delight myself. I can commit myself. And I can trust. So, my friends, every head bowed and every eye closed, my brothers and sisters. If you're out there, believer. But Pastor Adam, I know I've been a Thomas. I've got too much doubt. I've lost my joy. I know I haven't lost my salvation, but I've lost my joy. I've lost the, the pep in my step. I've lost my... I lost my laughter. I've lost it. And I'm really stressed about this situation. And it's dividing my family, it's dividing my coworkers, it's dividing people in my life. And I hate talking about it and I just have no peace about it. If that's you, raise your hand. All right, my friends, I told my father I'd do this. If you have your hand raised, would you have the courage, the fortitude and the guts to come down here with your brother Adam right now? I'm gonna wait for you. Come on. I mean, no, it's okay for Christians to come down to the altar. Some of you, you haven't been down here in so long, I need to introduce the, the altar to you. That's all right. The altar is a place where things can get laid and left. I want you all to think about that doubt, maybe unbelief, the stress, the anxiety, the pessimism, the worry. And I want you to put it in your hand and I want you to leave it at this altar when we're done praying. Literally, you that are up here will walk out better than those who walked in. Amen. Extend your hands towards these, my Thomas is here. Thomas ended up losing his doubt, going to India, and making a major difference. I'm here to tell you today, if God did it for the first Thomas, he could do it for all of us Thomases. Amen? We're gonna leave our doubt, our anxiety, our worry, and our stress, and we leave it at this altar, and we walk out, and we make a difference in people's lives. Every hand extended towards these that are here. Father, as we close this service today, May we as a doubter even be able to say, my Lord and my God. If a doubter could say that, what's keeping me from believing that? May I commit my ways to you, Lord. May I delight myself in you. May I have a joy that the world, CNN, Fox, MSNBC cannot wipe off my face no matter how bad the news gets. Because my life is in your hands, Lord. We delight ourselves in you and we commit our ways to you. And Lord, I believe the best is coming to all of these that are down here. My Lord and my God, you have something better for me. I know it. I struggle with it, but I know it, that you have something much better for me in the name of Jesus. Oh, take it, honey. Father, I come into agreement with these that are down here. We leave it. We don't take it home with us. Today is a day full of joy and a day full of smiles. And if somebody brings up crazy politics, we just laugh and say it's all in God's hands. Why? Because we trust in you 100%. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.